Hi, it's Colin Coward. I started the volume to bring you some of the most authentic voices in sports. While you're here, make sure you hit subscribe. Thanks. This is starting to look a little bit like a good basketball team. They have fixed their offense. The Lakers have an offensive rating of 126 points per 100 possessions in their last three games, which ranks third in the league. In a few minutes, I want to get into why I think that's the case, because I think it's an interesting example of scheming, which is something that has been a huge pet peeve of mine with the Lakers over the course of the last few seasons. But I wanted to start with LeBron because, you know, as LeBron fans would tell you, I've been very critical of him over the course of the last uh, like month or so. And it's because I hold LeBron to a very high standard because I think he's potentially the greatest basketball player to ever play the game because I throw his name around in conversations about who's the best player in the league. And I think there's a, a list of expectations that come with that. And after the all-star break, he came out and looked like a guy who didn't believe in this team and, 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 just essentially didn't provide the necessary effort for the Lakers to be competitive. Well, over this last stretch of games, he is 1,000% dialed back in. He is bought back into everything the team needs him to do. I think a huge part of it has been a little bit less of him at the center for stretches of the game, so he doesn't have as difficult of a defensive job. But at the end of the day, at the center position, when he's engaged and he's actually doing his job defensively, that's when this team is at their best. He had an absolutely vintage dunk. It was hilarious. I, I, I got into the game a little bit late because it was such an early start. And I was fast forwarding like little 10 second increments as I was trying to work up through the game. And I skipped ahead right as he was at the top of his dunk, like literally extended over the top of Kevin Love. And I was like, hold up, something crazy is about to happen. And I rewind and I saw the dunk. It's absolutely wild to me that he can make a play that athletic in his 19th season at age 37. That is, he is a uh, the greatest example of athletic longevity that I can remember seeing in my time following sports. That was one hell of a vintage highlight. But to make a long story short, LeBron's recent surge is perimeter shooting coming together, but a big part of it is him making a concerted effort to get to the rim. The Cleveland Cavaliers are one of the best interior defenses in the league. I've laid this out on the show before. They block a ton of shots, they have a ton of size, and their length will bother you around the rim. Now, some of this was LeBron taking advantage of Evan Mobley when he was off the floor, but a lot of it was just their five-out system. LeBron killed the Cavs inside. Laurie Markkinen could not handle him on his drives to the basket, and that was the fulcrum for so much of what they did offensively. So much of what this whole team has done offensively over the course of the last three games has to do with LeBron making a concerted effort to get in the paint. I was talking about this with some of my family as I was family and friends as I was watching the U of A get their big comeback win uh, last night over TCU. Like, there is no such thing as bad rim pressure. If you get into the basket and you attempt shots around the rim, even if you miss them, they have the a positive effect that comes from rim pressure. So, for instance, last night, the uh, TCU guards kept getting into the rim, and Christian Coloco had to step over and try to block shots, and it kept and TCU was getting offensive rebound putbacks. A huge part of what is making this offense work for the Lakers is LeBron putting in the work it takes, because it takes a lot of work. When, when, when everyone says, like, hey, why doesn't LeBron drive to the basket every time? Because it's exhausting. That's why he doesn't do it every time. But he's making a much more concerted effort to apply more rim pressure as of late. And that is opening everything up for this team. In addition to that, he's shooting like 40% from three on like nine attempts over the course of the last couple of weeks. That's a huge part of it too. He's got it working at every level of the game. He made a bunch of mid-range jump shots today. That little fadeaway over his right shoulder as he drifts through the lane, as he's snaking the pick and roll, is turning into one of his go-to moves. And he's, he's just got it all working on all cylinders right now. He is a testament to the the ability that that basketball IQ can replace basketball IQ and skill development can replace waning athleticism as he's aged as his athleticism has fallen off he has replaced that with remarkable skill and shot making and he understands the angles and the approach to offense so well at this phase in his career it's like he's a step ahead of everyone else on the court. For those of you who are just joining us, this is Hoops Tonight presented by FanDuel here on the volume. I wanted to move on to Russ for a second. 
I have some positive things to say about Russ. You know, Russ has a ton of bad that comes with him that's never going to go away. He's going to drift in and out focus defensively. He like even though he played mostly good against the Wizards a couple nights ago, there were a bunch of these like key possessions where he made mistakes. That I don't think is ever going to go away. We have too much evidence of the kind of guy that Russ is on the basketball court and where his head's at when he's out there for us to expect some sort of massive change from him. But as is the case with most guys like this, and Russ isn't the only guy like this in the league, there are guys that I call good play, bad play guys. They're players where they bring a lot of good, but they also bring a lot of bad. And so whether or not they impact winning has a lot to do with that scale shifting one way or another. Well, as of late, Russ is getting to the rim a lot as well, very similar to that rim pressure concept I was talking about with LeBron. But with his shot selection and his ability to get to the rim, he's slowing himself down. He's starting to make layups that he's usually missed. That has added a scoring element to Russ's game, which is allowing him to create shots for his teammates, spreading the ball out to the perimeter. And now he's starting to make a few more good plays every game. And over this recent stretch, we've tipped into Russ being a positive player, which has taken a lot off of what LeBron needs to bring to the table in order for them to win. There for a while, it was like, if LeBron doesn't score 50, the Lakers are going to lose. Well, now it's starting to look a little bit more like a functional basketball team. So I wanted to shout out Russ. I can be very critical of him at times. He's one of my least favorite players in the league. I had a fan ask me on Twitter today, like, hey, does this change your opinion about Russ coming back? Hell no. I want him off the team. I cannot wait to be done with the Russell Westbrook experience. But while he's here, I'm going to compliment him when he plays well, and we might as well try to win a championship while we're at it. So I wanted to shout out Russ. So I wanted to move on to the role players for a second, because this is a huge part of why the offense is where it's at. So LeBron is obviously playing really good offensive basketball of late, but he's been playing really good offensive basketball the vast majority of the season. But coming into this recent stretch, Offense has been a massive problem for the Lakers. They just simply haven't been able to score the basketball. It's certainly not, you know, commensurate to what their talent was. They added all the shooting. They added Malik Monk. They added Carmelo Anthony. They added these guys that were allegedly going to help them on the offensive end of the floor, and none of it materialized. A lot of that had to do with personnel, Frank playing weird combinations of non-shooters with the group. A lot of it had to do with them playing big the entire first part of the season. A lot of it is Frank not understanding that in the modern NBA, that five out basketball is what has success. But in five out basketball, it's more complicated than just can LeBron get to the basket or can Russ get to the basket. It's the concept of breaking the defense down. So this is where I want to shout out Stanley Johnson and Austin Reeves. So if you ask Stanley Johnson and Austin Reeves to come down against a set defense and to create a shot for a teammate, they would really struggle in that department. Austin Reeves doesn't have the talent, or excuse me, Austin Reeves doesn't have the physical tools, and Stanley Johnson doesn't have the skill. So those two players are going to struggle with that, that type of role. But if I let those two guys attack a compromised defense, so if Austin Reeves is catching the ball wide open on the wing and a dude is sprinting at him, and the defense is shifted over to the other side of the court, all of a sudden... Austin Reeves is great at making plays in that environment. Same thing goes for Stanley Johnson. So that's where this is so important. There is a, there is a process to running five out basketball. You got to have somebody at the beginning that can break down the defense and force that first rotation. But then you have to have guys after that first rotation that can continue to further compromise the defense. That's where Stanley Johnson and Austin Reeves have been so valuable. LeBron and Russ are playing really good offensive basketball right now to start possessions, and they're going to score a lot of the time, as you've seen. But most of the time, there's going to be help sent their way. And in order for that whole system to work, that second guy who attacks as the defense is compromised, that is the guy that is the key to creating the great shot. And the Lakers are getting great shots as of late. And a lot of it has to do with LeBron and AD, or excuse me, LeBron and Russ at the beginning of the possessions and guys like Stanley Johnson and Austin Reeves at the end of possessions, specifically Austin Reeves. I wanted to give him a, a big shout out tonight. He what he did to start that game offensively is ridiculous. You can tell he's got a whole other set of offensive moves and an offensive repertoire that is beyond what we've even seen with this team. And as of late, He's starting to unleash that 
little by little. He's very gifted at drawing fouls. He's very gifted at using his body to gain angles and gain position. He's got little floaters and push shots, and he's got the, the passes he was making in that first quarter to open teammates was really, really impressive to me. I have to shout those guys out. They're a huge part of why this offense is humming the way it is, and it's a really, really interesting example of how you can scheme your way around personnel shortcomings just like the Clippers did last year in the playoffs, as without Kawhi Leonard, they went on that run to the conference finals. It was all about scheming around personnel shortcomings. They had solid players. The Clippers are solid. But they didn't have all these stars that were going to go out and create everything. But it all just happened. It all just worked because Reggie, uh, Reggie Jackson and Paul George could make that first defensive rotation and everyone else was just feeding off of that and the Lakers are starting to capture a little bit of that which is something I've been begging for literally for years so it's good to see so the question becomes this is half of the issue right because the Lakers were a bad offensive team and they were a bad defensive team well they had seemed to have fixed their offense those were two of the five best defenses in the east that they just went in and just ran over offensively in this last three game stretch the Cavs are the second best defense in the east and the Raptors are the fifth best defense in the east and the Raptors defense is a lot more intimidating than the numbers would have shown you because they've dealt with injuries a lot this season but the Lakers offense that seems to be remedied and Anthony Davis is a clean and an easy plug-in to that system we saw that when he came back from the knee injury I'm not worried about fitting in Anthony Davis offensively so you have this other half of the pie here the defensive end of the floor. The Lakers obviously have to make significant strides on that end of the floor to have any chance of making it out of the play-in and beating Phoenix in the first round. And obviously they have a lot of work to do on that front, but that's where the Anthony Davis potential return makes that a much more achievable outcome. There was issues with personnel earlier in the season where even when those guys were healthy, none of this was working. But now, Avery Bradley's basically out of the rotation. DeAndre Jordan's not even on the roster anymore. Trevor Ariza's not playing anymore. A lot of the guys that were part of the, that issue aren't around anymore. We've brought in guys like Stanley Johnson, who is a great defensive player. We brought in Austin Reeves, who obviously brings a ton of the... Uh, Austin Reeves has been around all this this time, but he, of late, is now a consistent guy in the starting lineup. So that's a big part of it. Wenyan Gabriel raises our athletic profile. So the entire roster now has a little bit more athleticism, a little bit more foot speed with those lineups. So all you got to do is combine this little bit of magic that you've captured here with Anthony Davis coming back and good defensive habits, and you can do this. Again, it's a long shot. I would certainly like their chances a lot more if they didn't have to go through Phoenix in the first round. This is what pisses me off about the way they approach the season. If you're a seven seed or literally anything other than having to roll into Phoenix, then maybe you can weather through these injuries and get your stuff together in the playoff run. But that's not the case. This is they 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 have to basically beat the team I'm picking to win the championship, the Phoenix Suns, the team I think is clearly the best team in the league. The Lakers are going to have to go through them in the first round. So now it requires perfection. You need to get Anthony Davis back. You need to spend this next month establishing all the habits that you let slip by the wayside this entire season. But the the most important part of this entire thing that I'm laying out here is it's a realistic outcome now. It was very much not a realistic outcome in the past. Now, even if you want to call it a one in a million, whatever you want to call it, there is a realistic outcome to this Laker team making a run. It's LeBron James being the best player in the world. It's Anthony Davis being Anthony Davis. It's Russell Westbrook being a net positive instead of a net negative. And young, enthusiastic, energetic role players that fit within their scheme, do their jobs, and make the five-out dribble driving, uh, driving kick offense work. It makes sense now. I can see a light at the end of the tunnel. 